Today, I want to tell you about the number 19,861. Uh, it's a prime, and it's also what's called a strobogrammatic prime, which is a fancy way of saying that it reads the same upside down as it does right side up. And also, it, oh, hold on, someone's calling me. Oh, hey, Tibor. Hey, Ian? Oh, what is it? I'm working on my video for the Mega Fave Numbers Project. You know, the one where we have to share our favorite numbers larger than a million. Yeah, that's why I called. 19,861 isn't larger than a million. Oh, Shouldn't wait. Shouldn't you have a bigger number? You're right. I got it. In our last semester of college, the two of us began working on research related to the world's most famous unsolved math problem, the Riemann hypothesis. It began with us manipulating equations. It ended with us finding a counterexample to a 70-year-old conjecture. Hi. I'm Tibor Burdett. And I'm Ian Stewart. No, not that one. And this is our video. So in this first part of the video, oh, in this first part of the video, we're going to explain the concept of the abundance of a number. In other words, how big the parts of a number are, compared to the number itself. If you've been around the math world for any length of time, you've seen primes come up over and over again in many different contexts, and it can be hard to get a fresh perspective on them. But let's say you're only just now hearing about primes for the first time, and someone explains them to you like this. Primes are numbers which have only two factors, the smallest possible number. But one of the first things you might ask is, what's the largest possible number of factors a number can have? I mean, sure, we could just keep multiplying by primes until we have as many factors as we want, but it still feels like we should be able to talk about numbers with lots of factors. So let's take the size of the numbers into account. If we limit how big a number can be, then we limit how many factors it's able to have. But this is still a subtler question than it might seem at first. How do we know if a number has the most factors possible? Do we just count how many factors it has? Should we take the size of the factors into account? And if we do, how do we compare the size of the factors to the size of the original number? There's a lot of room to play with here, and mathematicians have come up with many different answers to this question, each of which is useful in its own way. You may have seen a number file video about antiprimes, in which James Grime talks about this set, the highly composite numbers. In our research, we used a different approach, first documented by Leonidas Alialu and Paul Erdős in 1944. Although Ramanujan had studied numbers with many factors 30 years earlier, these two were among the first to take the factors themselves into account. Here we have 59 and 60. Now 59 is a prime while 60 is not, so 59 will only have two factors while 60 will have many more. But let's take a closer look at the factors themselves. With 59, we only have the smallest possible factor, 1, and the largest possible factor, 59. But 60's factors cover much more of the range between 1 and 60, including some fairly large numbers. To get a more quantifiable handle on this, let's take the sum of the factors and compare it to the original number. In the case of 59, we get 60, which is barely larger than the original number. But with 60, the sum of the factors is 168 almost three times the original number. Mathematicians usually call the ratio between the sum of the factors of a number and the number itself the abundancy of a number. Think about it like farming. If we planted 60 seeds and got back 168 fruits, then we reaped an abundant harvest. But if we changed crops and planted seeds of 50 m minus instead, our harvest would be comparatively deficient. So to get a better sense of how abundancy behaves, Let's calculate the abundancies of the first few numbers. And while we're at it, let's look for a general formula for the abundancy of any given number. For one, there's obviously only one factor, so the sum of the factors is one, and the abundancy is one. Okay, no surprises there. Two is a prime, so it has two factors, one and two. Three and five are also primes, so they'll behave similarly. While four, as a square number, has an odd number of factors. It's not looking very interesting just yet, but we can make at least one observation. The abundancy of each prime number is just equal to 1 plus the reciprocal of the prime that we started with. 
And that makes sense. The 1 comes from the itself divided by itself part, and the 1 over p comes from the 1 divided by itself part. 6 is definitely the most interesting case that we've seen so far. Here we have four factors, 1, 2, 3, and 6. Notice something here. Their sum, 12, is a multiple of 6. This means that the abundancy is going to be a whole number, 2. Let's look at this a different way. Here are the four divisors of 6 again. Let's ignore the largest one, which is just the original number, and add up the remaining ones. We get 6, the same number that we started with. The Greeks found this property of 6 to be extremely pleasing, so they called it a perfect number. If the sum of a number's divisors ended up being too large, they would call it abundant. And if the sum of a number's divisors was too small, they would call it deficient. Based on what we found up to this point, we can see that every prime is going to be deficient, since the sum 1 plus 1 over p can never be bigger than 2. But we haven't found any abundant numbers yet. To find our first number with an abundancy bigger than 2, we have to go all the way out to 12. Let's shake things up a bit here. Instead of adding up all of the factors and then dividing by n, let's see what happens if we divide by n first. Interesting. The denominators of these fractions are all of the factors that we started with. What's going on? Well, every factor can be paired with another factor such that when you multiply the two together, you get the original number. Rearranging this equation, we see that when you divide one factor by n, the factor cancels out, and you get 1 divided by the other factor. Every factor was represented once at the beginning, so every factor gets represented at the end. Armed with this knowledge, we can find a general formula for the abundancy of any number, given its prime factorization. While we don't have the time here, we highly encourage you to prove this for yourself. We'll provide you with a couple of stepping stones that we used to help you get started. First, we came up with a formula that gave us the abundancy of any power of a prime, such as 4, 8, or 9. Once you have that, all you'll need to show is that when you multiply two prime powers together, their abundancies multiply together as well. This formula is extremely useful. We no longer have to sit down and calculate all of the factors of a number whenever we want to compute its abundancy, especially when it's so easy to miss one. As long as we know how the number factors into primes, we can calculate its abundancy just like that. So let's compute the abundancies of a whole bunch more numbers and see if we can find any patterns. Okay, this looks like a good place to stop. With the first 1,000 numbers plotted, several trends are clearly visible. The abundancy function itself jumps around wildly, with a lot of sharp peaks and narrow troughs. But we can also see some structure in this data. For example, look at this lower line of numbers whose abundancies hover just above 1. Yep, you guessed it, it's the primes! With only two factors, they have just enough for security authentication while adding as little as possible to their abundancies. We can also see other lines for multiples of 2 in a prime, multiples of 3 in a prime, and so on. But what about the top, where those large spikes are? Here, we're drawing a curve that shows the numbers with the largest abundancies that we've found so far. If we find a more abundant number, the curve goes up. The first few of these numbers are 1, 2, 4, 6, 12, and so on. Since these numbers have larger abundancies than any number smaller than them, mathematicians call these the superabundant numbers. Now, superabundant numbers have a whole bunch of interesting properties. And the first one we're going to look at is that if you look at their prime factorizations, their exponent... Okay, so the point is, there's a lot of interesting properties of superabundant numbers that mathematicians have found over the past 75 years. But why do we care? Sure, it can be interesting to look at numbers with lots of large factors, but why does it matter? Well, in the past 40 years, someone made an important discovery about superabundant numbers, one that makes them a very exciting field to study. Let's look back at that abundancy chart of the first thousand integers. If we just focus on the superabundant numbers, we notice that they appear to follow a logarithm-shaped distribution. Let's make the x-axis logarithmic. This should cancel out the log shape and make the superabundant numbers appear to follow a straight line. Now let's add, oh, about 10,000 superabundant numbers or so, and see how the graph changes. Oh, 
Well, it looks like the numbers don't follow a log distribution after all. But wait a second, this distribution looks pretty logarithm shaped too. Since the x-axis is scaled, this would make it a log-log distribution. And that's exactly what Thomas Gronwall proved in 1913. That as n gets larger and larger, its abundancy tends towards log-log n multiplied by a constant. If we graph this curve along with our function, it's a perfect match. If you notice, it seems that whenever n is greater than 5040, the abundancy of n is always less than the function it approximates. But is this always the case? A mathematician named Guy Robin proved that this question is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. But this only goes to a thousand. Okay. If you haven't heard of the Riemann hypothesis before, here's a quick summary. There are many different equivalent statements of the Riemann hypothesis across multiple branches of mathematics. The most common version has to do with the Riemann zeta function and states that all non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function lie on the critical line with real value 1 over 2. While this is the most common statement of the hypothesis, it's not the most transparent. A much clearer statement of the hypothesis has to do with the distribution of prime numbers. In this case, pi has nothing to do with 3.14. Mathematicians use the notation pi of n to mean the number of primes less than n. The problem with this function is that it's extremely hard to compute. Primes are still one of the most mysterious subjects in mathematics, and we don't know of many methods better than just counting all the primes. However, mathematicians did discover one function that does a fairly good job estimating the number of primes. The Riemann hypothesis says that not only is the approximation a good one, but that it's extremely good with a very specific small error term. In other words, we will finally have some grasp of the fundamental structure of the primes. And Guy Robin showed us that we can prove this inequality by looking at the superabundant numbers. So, after some extensive research, we would like to announce that we... Didn't exactly prove the Riemann hypothesis. Not yet. Because proving the Riemann hypothesis is hard. The good news, though, is there are two ways to prove something. Either explain why it's true... Or found a counterexample to show that it's false. With the hunt on for counterexamples to Robin's inequality, we turned to all the resources that we could find. We quickly discovered a list of the first million superabundant numbers published to the online encyclopedia of integer sequences in 2009. We checked all of those and it held up. No counterexamples here. But this was just the first million. Why stop there? Well, it turns out that finding superabundant numbers is also hard. But not because of any mathematical gymnastics. It's because of computer power. Based on what we've said so far, in order to prove that any number is superabundant, you have to check its abundancy against that of every smaller number. If our number is less than a few billion, a computer can do that reasonably quickly. But that only gets us about 50 superabundant numbers or so before the computer throws an error. To go farther, we're going to need a method that doesn't involve checking that many numbers. The best method would be an algorithm that finds the superabundant numbers and nothing else. Unfortunately, if such an algorithm exists, no one has found it yet. In 2006, Keith Briggs published an article about abundant numbers, in which he explained that, to his knowledge, no algorithm for computing all superabundant numbers up to a given maximum is known. He provided his own method, which first narrows down a list of numbers to check to a smaller list of candidates, then runs through each of those. However, as we look for larger and larger superabundant numbers, this method checks far more numbers than it needs to, while the actual list of superabundant numbers seems to be much more tightly concentrated. And this is where we came in. As undergrads, neither of us was exposed to much math research. Our classes were mostly teaching us tools, with the fun stuff being saved for grad school. But then, we signed up for the mandatory math communications course. Now at the University of Kentucky, this course is taught by a different professor every year. And this year, it was taught by Dr. Ben Braun. It was awesome. He covered a wide range of topics, and he had us discussing these topics in groups that he shuffled every week. Some of the homework assignments were easy, and some were hard. We learned a lot. But the best homework assignment had to be Homework 7, where he said, Okay, here's an unsolved problem. It's worth a million dollars. Do something interesting with it and write it down, turn it in. So we got to work.
We quickly found out that the problem was Roban's inequality in disguise, and we zeroed in on the superabundant numbers. At first, we tried messing around with the equations, but eventually we started playing around with the numbers themselves to see if we could find any unusual or interesting properties. Eventually, we found a game changer. Look at the number 60. If you divide it by 5, you get 12. And if you multiply it by 2, you get 120. All three of these numbers are superabundant. In fact, if you look at any number on this list greater than 1, you can always multiply or divide by a single prime to get another superabundant number. This links the superabundant numbers together into a complicated lattice, starting at 1. As we repeatedly multiply by primes, the entire list of superabundant numbers spreads out before us. Three things make this lattice interesting. First, every number joins back to 1 at the top. Second, if you just multiply repeatedly, there are no loops. You can't go backwards. Third, this graph has one source and no sinks. Wait, what does that mean? That means it's time for Sources and Sinks with Jonathan Clark. Now, suppose that we have a directed graph. That is one that has edges that are directed from one vertex to another. Now, if we had a vertex for which all of the edges that it was connected to were directed away from it, we would call that a source. And if we had a vertex for which all of the edges it was connected to were directing into it, we would call that a sink. You can imagine as if water were flowing in this graph along the edges and a source has all of the water flowing from it to the world, and a sink has all of the water flowing into it, down the drain. We found out that we weren't the first to discover this property. Aleolu and Erdős had conjectured about this property back in 1944. Still, if it were true, then it would mean that we could find a much faster algorithm. If we imagine flooding the graph at 1, we could follow the water as it branches off and discover all of the superabundant numbers. We would still have to throw out some candidates, but nowhere nearly as many as with the old method. So we coded up an algorithm. As we built it, we checked it against the list from OEIS, just to make sure that it was working correctly. But something strange was happening. Once the algorithm got to a certain point, it would skip a number, then keep going. We tried dialing up the precision to ludicrous levels. No matter how far it went, it always skipped that number. We finally decided to check the list, and on June 11th, at 3.30 in the morning, we made a startling discovery. Hey, Tibor. What is it, Ian? I think I just discovered a counterexample for Alaglu and Erdős' conjecture. And this, at long last, is where 19,861 comes in. It turns out that both parts of the original conjecture were false. There are some superabundant numbers where you can only find a superabundant number by multiplying, not dividing, and vice versa. The 19,861st superabundant number is the first one where you can only multiply, not divide. In other words, if you flood the entire graph from one and only multiply, you will never reach this number. That makes it a second source, disproving the original conjecture. So now that we've found this number, what's it like? Well, it's enormous. It's roughly equal to 6.04 times 10 to the 2448, which looks so much like Avogadro's number, but isn't. Its prime factorization is equally enormous. It uses all of the primes up to 5591, Here's a visualization of what the lattice around our number is like. As you can see, it sticks up like a big stalagmite. And here's the lattice around the smallest counterexample to the other half of the conjecture. We can only divide from this number, not multiply, which makes it a sink. This number is much smaller only being about 3.5 times 10 to the 389. In total, we found 18 sources and 88 sinks less than 10 to the 100,000. 
As far as we're aware, nobody else has disproven this conjecture since it was first proposed in 1944. We've written our results up in a short paper, which you can find here on Archive. The problem is, this breaks our algorithm. If we only navigate through the lattice upwards from 1, then we'll miss all these kinds of numbers. So what do we do now? Even though flooding the lattice in one direction didn't work, we might not be stuck with the slower, less efficient method from Briggs's paper. It might be possible for us to switch which way the water flows. We could still start at one, then repeatedly tip the graph so that the water flows into the sources. As long as the entire graph is in one piece, we should eventually cover every point. And who knows, we might be able to tighten up some old methods as well. Maybe we can find better bounds for the superabundant numbers than the ones in Briggs's paper. In any case, our research is far from over. As we continue to generate millions and possibly billions of superabundant numbers, what new and exciting patterns will there be to find? What insight can we gain into the most beautiful problem in modern mathematics? Well, I think we've said all that we needed to say. Is there anything else you can think of? No, don't think so. All right. Well, have a good one. <laughs>